Welcome to Spectrum Perspectives, real talk with parents, professionals, and autism advocates with your host, Cindy Gellermini. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Spectrum Perspectives. And we are going to be talking to a mom today that has a fascinating story. We're going to delve into the supernatural a little bit, and she is going to tell us about how her son started to use the rapid prompting method. And this is, seems to be a recurring theme here as I'm talking to moms of these kids that use RPM. And the things that they start saying are going to knock your socks off and are going to blow you away. Um, this boy sees angels among many other things. So I can't wait to bring you this episode. Hold on to your hats and here we go. Hi everybody, this is Cindy and we are here with another episode of Spectrum Perspectives and we are going to meet Katie today. Katie is a mom of a son with autism. Hi Katie, welcome. Hi. And what is your son's name? His name's Houston. Awesome. So tell me Perfect. a little bit about, first of all, how many kids do you have all together? I have five. You have five. And what, so what number is he in birth order? He's, he's he, number two. He's number two. Okay. So tell me about um, your pregnancy. Did you have a normal pregnancy? Were there any red flags, any complications? There was a red flag. Um, the, I had a, the alpha fetal protein test. Something came up funny with it and they wanted to do genetic testing they did genetic testing. They found absolutely nothing at all. Yeah. And then, well, then the next question is um, about the, the birth. Um, did you have any complications during the birth in the hospital? And then um, no complications during the birth. Um, he did have jaundice and um, just some typical birth, um, you know, after birth issues. But honestly, those were due to, cause he's much older, he's 24. So back at that time, um, the insurance companies didn't want moms to stay in the hospital. So they would send everyone home as soon as you had the baby, they would send you home. And so there were complications because of that, but it was really just because they hadn't had the normal um, neonatal care in uh, the hospital to notify, you know, to locate you know, if there were going to be any issues with jaundice or Billy Rubin and all of that. Okay. Um, because I'm leading up to when you found out that your son had autism. Um, and so I always want to know, were you suspicious of anything? Were there any kind of red flags ahead of time or did it just sort of come, you know, out of nowhere? Mm -hmm. So the next question is, uh, you know, how about his development? Was, was his development delayed? Was it on target? Right. He was uh, perfectly um, developing perfectly until his um, DTP hip shot and he was around eight months old. So it was a little late for that DTP hip, but whenever we um, got it, it was a couple of days later, I noticed he had little red freckles. And I was like, that's weird. Where, where are those? He said, you're too young to get freckles. We're not outside, like what's going on? And the next day there were a few more and I was introducing new foods at the time. You know, you do one food to see if there's an allergy. And so eventually I was just trying to figure out, is it this food or, you know, what could possibly be the cause for these little, I thought it was a rash and I thought it would just go away. So the third day when I went in to pick him up out of his crib, he was completely covered wow. head to toe in red freckles. And I'm like, okay, not okay. Right. And I called the doctor. It was a Saturday morning. They said, bring him in immediately, which they never would do that. That was mm -hmm. odd. So I brought him in, the doctor came in, took one look, walked back out, came back in, said, he's been admitted to Arnold Palmer Hospital. Would you like an ambulance? And I said, why? And they said, um, we need to do tests. And so I took him for? there. What were they testing for? They wouldn't tell me. Huh. They didn't want to scare me. And whenever we got there, a hematologist met us and said, didn't even hesitate, um, crossed her legs and said, your son has either has leukemia or immune thrombocytopenic purpura. Wow. Um, I, did, I wanted him to have the one I couldn't pronounce. Yeah. Okay. Because I, <laughs> I knew what leukemia was. Right. They were actually both really bad. Um, and he ended up having ITP. And what that is, is an autoimmune disease where your body um, kills your blood platelets. And it just basically goes into overdrive attacking. And she said it was from the immunizations. 
um, that his body, the way she described it is his body can't tell the difference. And so it's attacking more than just the immunizations that he, you know, the diseases and the immunizations, it, it's attacking everything. Obviously, I just wanted that gone and I didn't know, you know, how to make it go away. And um, they gave him uh, IVIG, which is gamma globulin, and he got infusions of that over a period of months. And then they decided, okay, he's better now. His levels are up enough and he's good. And he continued to get the petechia, which no one ever really explained to me, like, why? Why? Because the they rash? told me he was, is that the, yes, that's the red dot. Okay. Um, and what it is, is it's the little blood capillaries breaking. And so it's okay. little blood vessels breaking. Okay. But there was, they were like, well, his, it's not everywhere. So it's fine. What I didn't know at the time, because no one told me, was that's essentially a sign of chronic ITP, which meant his body was continuing to kill and attack itself. After that, these were the things I noticed. All of a sudden, couldn't make eye contact. Then he lost the ability to clap his hands. He, he literally couldn't touch his hands together. And then I would try to roll a ball to him and he couldn't roll the ball back to me. And those were the first things I saw. And this was at eight months old? Yes. Well, I, the, I would say the shot was at eight months old. The developmental things were a couple months after that is when I started noticing all of that. Right. So when did you get an uh, autism diagnosis? At the time, it took us forever to get the diagnosis. They're much better about it. But at the time, he, it wasn't until he was three and a half. Hmm. And in that time, he developed horrific sores all over his body, chronic diarrhea, screaming through the night, couldn't sleep, um, constantly running, holding everything in his hands, ripping everything apart ear, like this all the time holding his ears. I mean, the rashes all over his body were, they were, he couldn't, he had such bad diarrhea that it would make his bottom bleed. Then he was fecal smearing. And, and this is all why we're waiting for an appointment to get a diagnosis. So what did the pediatrician say about that? Um, nothing. Mm -hmm. If you're not a cookie cutter, they didn't really have an answer. I went to a, a specialist for, you know, all the GI issues and he was dismissive would be the very nice way of saying what he was. So it was not how it was today. And I was trying to read, read you know, medical journals and try to figure out what was wrong with my son. Hmm. Okay. So three and a half, did you have him in any kind of preschool or anything at the time? They had a program here called Babies Can't Wait that once he got his diagnosis, he was admitted to. That's well, that I meant before. Like, was he in anything before, before the diagnosis? No. Okay. okay. Um, we were basically asked to leave any kind of typical program. Oh, you were. That's that that's kind of what I wanted to know. You tried to put him in a program and yeah. they, they asked him to leave. Correct. Huh. Okay. So then he got a diagnosis. Then you were able to put him in a in a program. It was it for autistic kids or it was the special needs program um for the county. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, they, they called it babies can't wait back then. I don't know if that's still the name. And it was basically like a preschool for people, for young children with um, developmental delays. So then did he go to a regular school after that? No, no, his, he had severe elopement and he was completely nonverbal. Yeah. And elopement just for, I, I always stop moms because we oh. stop these terms. Elopement <laughs> means they run away. They're running. Right. <laughs> Usually <laughs> naked I too. So, <laughs> so yeah. In um, my children's we, book series, in my, in my children's books, there's 12 here. I'll show you. Look, there's 12 chapters and in almost uh -huh. every chapter he elopes. So just. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, I was on a first name basis with the local police and fire yes. department. There so, you go. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, we, yeah, it yeah. Was great. The fire department show and that, all of our chapters. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Same um, <laughs> it was. I remember one time. Um, you know, this is actually a really funny story. My, uh, I was potty training my youngest, and at that time, of course, my place was like Fort Knox. Like mm -hmm. everything was locked up, so secure because he'd gotten through. He had climbed through our attic and climbed out out the room over the garage, climbed out a back staircase, and gone into somebody else's basement and broken into their home. And so I had the place like Fort Knox, 
And I was sitting there beside the toilet, encouraging my little baby to go potty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was this really like sinister, serious knock on the back door. And it startled me because the, the bathroom was right there. And, I, and the cop knocks at the door. I open it and I'm terrified because immediately I know he's standing there to tell me that my son is dead. Oh. That's mm -hmm. what I know is about to happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm frozen. And he's like, is your son missing? And I'm sitting there going, I didn't hear the alarm go off. I've locked, every single thing is locked. Like, how could he have gotten out? Like, mm -hmm. we've we've drilled all the attic space, you know, uh, crawl spaces shut. Like, right. how could he have gotten out? And he said, he did, I, I'm still not able to answer. And he said, well, we found your son, what, who we think is your son, naked. Mm -hmm. And right as he says the word naked, my little one that's been on the potty. Oh, no runs out naked oh, no. <laughs> and he's looking and like, I'm like family. Oh, but I swear we believe in clothes <laughs> anyway they found my son naked of course swimming in um someone's pool oh. several houses down and okay. of course he we've had um an escape on Martha's Vineyard where we thought he was in the ocean and we were never going to see him again there's too many to tell yeah yeah but but um, interestingly I but, always yes. like to make this point he was going for the water right he's going for the neighbor's pool you're worried about him going to the ocean they yes. have a fascination with the water and I always try to tell moms of the little ones very very important that you teach your kids how to swim at a very early age because this is what happens they elope they head for the water yes we don't want to have any drowning deaths, please. And at least your son had the sense to take his clothes off and not jump in and get all his clothes wet. <laughs> I think he lost his clothes well before he got to the water. That <laughs> he didn't really believe in clothes at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if they have sensory issues, a lot, you know, clothes feel scratchy mm -hmm. to them and they, 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 they just don't like, you know, the texture of clothes on their body. A lot of times it's very irritating. And another time that um, they got lost, the police asked me, well, what was he wearing? And I'm like, well, now or then? I mean, who knows? <laughs> and of course, they found him naked. Okay. And a couple of days later, my my neighbor comes back and she's like, "Are these Houston's pants?" <laughs> and she had found his pants in her basement, oh, or his sorry. pants in her basement. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Okay. <laughs> so now, can he speak? Is he verbal? So he began using minimal mostly like echolalic or scripting when I would say okay hold on so echolalia for people that don't know it means they echo you they repeat and you say hi how are you they say hi how are you like they'll repeat or or they repeat lines of movies I knew a little girl that used and she just used to repeat lines out of Disney movies all the time that was the, the her whole that that would be my son yeah. he's still and of course and he was really fascinated with the um previews so even today He'll sit there and he, and he spells to communicate now. So, but he'll still sit there and he'll go coming to Disney and or coming to video in 1998. Yes. Coming to video in 1998, and I'm like, you were too. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> like, they don't even have videos anymore. Stop uh, it. <laughs> right. It's so funny because normally, for me, I skip past all the previews. But for my son, it's like, oh no, no, no. They like that. They like their repetition. It's like, don't skip past that part. <laughs> something hypnotic going on yeah and it was I, I was talking to this parents who have a seven-year-old and they're like well he loves the um the credits and I'm like please do yourself a favor and do not let him watch any credits at all <laughs> oh oh yeah especially if he can read them then he'll start repeating it right I mean, that's exactly right exactly so I have talked to a couple moms uh that have talked about the rapid prompting method rpm um, one of them showed us, we had a little video of her mm -hmm. working with her yes. son doing the rapid prompting. She explained it to us. So your son also can communicate yes. with the RPM. So how long ago was that? How old was he? He was 21 and a half, almost 22 years old. Does he go to a day program? So, um, all day? What does he do? Well, so I had heard about, the, and I'd even met with a mom about this method and everything. And like so many other moms, and, and remember, my son's old, 
compared to so many of these kids that are much younger. Through the years, for two decades, everyone was like, oh, have you tried this? Have you tried that? And pr I promise you, whatever it is you're going to tell me and ask me, I did. I tried it and, you know, really no help. And so somebody had told me about this method and I actually listened to her and I was like, gosh, that, I feel like that might actually work. But in my head, it was that same voice that said, her son's not as severe as my son. It won't work for my son. Mm -hmm. It works for her son because he's not as severe. I was wrong. Her son was as pretty much nonverbal like my son, but I didn't see it. So I didn't know. And we had a miraculous meeting with um, another family that we had known from when Houston was very little from church. And so this dad, though, was living it when I ran into him and I knew the family came. He said, in no way do I want to tell you what to do. Like, you know, you know what's best, but I want to share with you what we've done with our son. And he starts to proceed to tell me the exact same story that this other mom had told me about. The difference was I knew this son, I knew this young man, and I knew it was as severe as my son. So I listened. So the dad starts telling me about it, and he tells this really funny story. He goes, well, like, for example, our son kept saying, park, park, park. And so we were always taking him to the park. And then once he was able to communicate, he said, I know I keep saying park. I can't stop myself. I don't want to go to the park. Oh, no. <laughs> and I was like, no, yeah, <laughs> because that's what you do. You respond to what comes out of their mouth. What that actually is, is apraxia. Have you explained apraxia to your? No, no, nope. there you go. Okay. So apraxia is a neurological condition where you're, um, the motor processing is dysfunctional and it's not sending the appropriate motor planning to all of the parts of your body that control speech. And so the body forces out words that the mind is not thinking and not wanting to say. Okay. So I have we a friend that had a blitz. stroke. I have a friend that had a stroke and she, it's, it's, yeah. it's very similar. That was my understanding when yeah. Robbie was really little. I met a mom that her kid was facilitating, meaning he was typing and mm -hmm. he said to her, I know that I, I keep saying that I want a cookie, but I don't want a cookie. I want a cracker. And the wrong word was coming out. He, you know, his mind is saying one yeah. thing and a different word is coming out of the mouth. So that's what, that's what you're, that's what you're saying. So just. So, so yes. Except it's to the extreme. Stuff. Yeah. Right. And that is very common with stroke victims. Um, but with autism, it's to an extreme because it's a complete disconnect between their brain and body. And so the body is basically like this wild wires, literally. It's just shooting off all these things that the right. brain is not wanting it, the body to do. Right. Um, so I was very intrigued when he said that. And then this man started talking to my son as if he was a neurotypical and mm -hmm. communicating just like you would talk to anyone. And no one had ever spoken to my son that way his entire mm -hmm. life. Right. And I was just in shock. I'm like looking at him going, what are you, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I turned back around and this young man who was nonverbal had taken, and he has, um, he has lots of impulsive arm movement and he um, had taken his arm, hold of his arms and was holding his arms to keep his arms from moving and was staring at me in the eyes like had like done you could tell there was so much effort trying to stare at me and he looked at me like he was looking into my soul and in that moment you know how when you connect with somebody with their eyes and you just know that they're talking to your heart mm -hmm. and I knew he's in there mm -hmm. and I suddenly had the realization that my son was in there mm -hmm. and so I went to meet with this family they showed me the boards they answered all my questions and these were complex questions I was asking. Um, I asked about math, for example. And this young man answered, literally, like he was zooming on the boards. He was like this all over. Wow. And which not everybody is, because they all have different motor processing. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, I'm not that great at math, but some of my friends are incredible. Math is just not my forte. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, he said, forte? <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, right. right. Okay. Yeah. And I asked about friends and he was got all excited and he's like, that's the best part. Now I can, you know, have all these relationships with people and I, just these elaborate 
intelligent answers. Mm -hmm. He explained about how his body and brain were disconnected. And he, he gave me these wonderful explanations for what I was looking at and didn't understand. Were the parents giving him hand over hand as he was doing this? He was doing it independently. Independently. Huh. Yeah. Okay. And I know that they've said that the criticism of it is that they're not really doing it. It's that the, the, the person doing it with them is really the one answering. So that's why I'm curious. Um, I, I do understand why people would make that criticism, which if you have the reason why people need that support is they have no, okay. That goes back to like the neurology of what's going on and what's happening is their vestibular and proprioceptive systems do not work like ours do. They have no sense of orientation for where they are in space. And so that makes pointing or moving your body at all incredibly difficult. And the reason somebody is, they're actually, when somebody's doing facilitated communication, which is what you're describing, they're actually not helping them at all. They're actually pushing against, but it's to give them some kind of input so that they know, okay, where they are. The thing about your vestibular system and whenever you talk about sensory, that's why vestibular is so important. Vestibular is your most primal sense. It's one that we, we think there are five senses. There are really more than that. Your vestibular sense is where you are in space. It's the one, you know, how you pick up a newborn and they go, you know, like this. <laughs> that's because they don't know where they are. Right. They haven't developed that vestibular. The vestibular takes in your eyesight and your hearing and it and it's processed in your vestibular organ and sends information to the whole body of where you are. You know how you swaddle babies to like make them feel safe and snug and well, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. They don't have that connection with the rest of their body. The proprioceptive is in your muscles and joints and it tells you how much force to use. It's why autistics will sometimes be low tone or very aggressive because they have no, there's no orientation. So they don't know if they're using too much or too little. Right. They have no idea. Right. So my son slammed all the doors and, you know, he, he, I he can't help it. He's no idea. There's no reference point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we think it's, and, and what's horrible is here, they have no idea how, if they're using too much, too little or anything, or even to control it. And then we call it a behavior. Right. And this young man that I was telling you about that spelled this basically our hero, um, he made a wonderful point to one of the behaviorists um, in the public school system um, when she had said, um, all behavior is communication. And he said, he responded, spelling it out, behavior implies intent. If there's no control, there's no intent. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, and they, so many of these kids are so frustrated because they are treated like your behavior and ABA is behavior. Right. It's um, treating them like, uh, I'll try to not say <laughs> derogatory things about that. And our friends have all said the same thing that it was humiliating to them to do ABA and be asked the same things over and over again when they understood the concepts and they just couldn't control their body to get the correct answer. Okay. It was debilitating. Right. And he said, um, my son, when he finally could communicate just over and over how horrible it was to be treated like he wasn't intelligent and to be excluded and to not have friends. Oh, but I, I have to tell what my friend said. At the end of that little meeting, he asked, I said, I know you have something to say to me. I can tell. Mm -hmm. What is it you want to say? Yeah. And he said, um, do not let time or money or the fact that you've tried a zillion different interventions over the years, make you gun shy. This is the real deal. It works. We don't need a cure. We just need a chance to live life as who we really are. We are wonderful people. We just need the same chance to be known that everyone else gets effortlessly. I, he said, I'm sure Houston is as excited to get to know you as you are to, to get to know him. Wow. So that was the beginning of our journey. I brought my... Um, two of my boys over to meet him and they were like do you think and he was answering my boys questions like like they were asking him like what what movies like teenager what questions you, like? you know yeah. like what movies do you like and and I asked at the end of that meeting I said do you have you know other abilities like I'd heard about like photographic memories and synesthesia that was some of the in the reading I had done 
And he affirmed that, yes. And I was like, okay. And so we got back in the car and my other boys were like, um, do you think that Houston is like him? And I'm like, I do. And then my son goes, well, then he thinks we're a-holes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh. well, yes. you are. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? as I'm talking to other moms like you, mm -hmm. it's really making me think, oh my goodness, what have I said? Oh know? yeah. And I know when I see, to me, he was always like a toddler mentally because his understanding seemed to only be at a toddler level. And whenever I said that to someone, he would get so agitated and so mad. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, he doesn't like when I say that, you know, but, but I'm like, how do you un even understand what I'm saying? Yeah, they are completely in there. They're trapped, and it's a horrific. Um, my son said uh, he prepared this for um, uh, director of special education for the county that we live in. So he, here's what he said. Nothing about my life seems meant to forge a new wave of communication, but somehow I was chosen for this purpose. Stories soon are coming that will make you know autistics rightly just need a voice like anyone. With autism, our mind's prison, the most tortuous prison, makes stopping our body basically impossible. Applying myself always takes every ounce of energy. People form opinions about our intelligence based on our bodies that we can't control. Sometimes my mind can't even sort out people's words from the many repetitious phrases in my head. Getting my mind to focus is such a task. Hearing everything at every decibel is excruciating. Remember that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Teachers taught me to use visual props. However, my eyes see triple and the images I see move, causing me to wonder what I'm seeing. Sometime you should try to imagine how difficult this life is to never have meaningful social relationships, just social isolation. You're then sometimes treated like a two-year-old. To try to not care is not possible for someone with a brilliant mind. The moment my life changed was when I could spell my thoughts. Now my story is beginning and my future is going to be filled with beauty and friends and accomplishments. Could you give my friends the opportunity to have a voice? This is your chance to make a difference and save lives. I'm not asking anything for myself. I just made a promise and I'm keeping it. It is critical you believe in their competence just like you believe in mine. Stop letting other people tell you what my friends are not capable of and let them speak for themselves. My boyhood fears were that all I meant to say would never be heard. You cannot believe how many watch me now to know there is hope for their life. Test me. I should most like to wow you. Your son said all that? All that. <laughs> one letter at a time. One painful letter wow. at a time. And so do you sit there and write, write it down as he's tapping it out? Yes. Okay. Yeah. How do you know when it's, when it's one word and then another word and another word? Is there a space or do you just have to kind of figure There is a space. I mean, in the beginning when we were using the stencil, there's no space really on the stencil. You can kind of use the hand holder thing, but I didn't. It was just logical because right. yeah you just could sort of figure you, it just like you and I kind of know when a word stops and when a word begins mm -hmm. it was obvious when you're spelling something out so when a word you, stopped so how did you start the rpm so after you went to visit your friend and his son was doing it did they send where did they send you how did you where did you go we um I went to a workshop I saw some kids doing some incredible things I saw a girl um, get on the boards for the very first time and did a lesson, I believe it was on photosynthesis and spelled out photosynthesis while her body was all over the place and she was making noises that pierced my ears. Wow. And because I just want to help other parents when they yeah. listen to this or watch, you know, and they say, hey, I want to look into this. How do they find out about it? I mean, they can Google it, I guess. I'm um, sure probably videos the, on YouTube or something. The founder of this yeah, her name is Soma, and she's in um, Austin, Texas. She sat down. Um, we actually, because we didn't know her until just recently, mm -hmm. and we went to someone else who had been trained, who trained me, and then I basically, like, ordered lessons and just became a bulldog and was like... <laughs> My son would be so exhausted. His body would just be falling over. I'm like, nope, we're not dead. We're going to keep going. Okay, now, I, so I want to get back to like the sensory because that is huge. People don't realize how critical that is. 
do you remember how I said, how he said, um, you know, hearing everything at every decibel was excruciating? Well, there essentially what is going on is um, like I went to, he was complaining about that so much. And a doctor told me he has hyperacusis, which if anyone doesn't know, is basically a sensitivity to higher decibels and can be excruciating um, certain frequencies. That's why a lot of and, autistic kids hold their ears. Right. Because but it's actually more than that. Yeah. It yeah. can be hyperacusis, but it is actually quite often more related to something called misophonia. And misophonia is a neurological condition where um, certain sounds produce, um, they trigger the amygdala to the fight or flight. And so it triggers the most intense amount of anxiety possible. So it's like in horrific anxiety. And when that happens, it like cuts off access to their frontal lobe and their, their body, which they already don't have control over, takes over. And so then they're in that self-interest stage or the aggressive stage, whatever they do to whatever their body does to combat anxiety. That's a reaction to what's going on in their brain. And what kind of noises is this? Are you talking about that? that causes for some people with who I would say is more mild, it would be like a baby crying or the intercoms or, you know, like loud noises. It, it, see, that's the thing is, it's not necessarily a volume. Okay. It's a particular sound. Got it. Um, now, I kind of want to go into like the other part of what they hear because that's what's so important for people to understand is they are hearing things we are not hearing. Mm -hmm. So their brains are open up. We perceive about 4% of the actual energy and frequencies and wavelengths that are coming, that are around us. We just don't have the receptor. Our brain doesn't receive the other information, but it's still there, even if we don't receive it. For example, think about a dog. There's nothing going on and your dog starts barking like crazy because it hears something that you don't. Right. Just because you don't hear it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means mm -hmm. your equipment doesn't receive it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so our kids are like the, a lot of the animal brains that can receive way more information and process it than we can. But because we don't see it, we think they're just reacting when actually they are reacting, but they're actually having an appropriate reaction. Right. Because um, I know they could walk into a Costco or something and the fluorescent lights in the in that space, they they hear. They they hear this high pitched sound that we don't hear and that can And it's out. what people don't realize is that all the things like all the things around us, like we perceive sight, we per what we call sight is light waves, you know, sound you know, what we hear is sound waves and, mm -hmm. you know, um, smell is chemical emissions, um, you know, and touch is actually, you know, different combinations of mass and heat and force. That's what we're experiencing. That's all different wavelengths of energy. They're just receiving a lot more of it. And then they don't have the ability to process it and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is why my body's reacting. I don't have any way to control my body, but I'm taking in too much. It's way too much in and no out. Um, that in itself creates massive anxiety. But then on top of that, because they don't have, they have a motor processing disability, um, they can't coordinate the proper motor response. And that's horrific. With my son, his hearing, and oh, and he talked about his eyes. That's interesting. So he sees triple of everything and it moves. You know how like kids have trouble like making eye contact? Yes. Well, if you saw six eyeballs, huh? I don't know, which one do you look at? Like, I'm just guessing. You're like, which one? Okay. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, but what that, again, that back to the vestibular, because your brain takes in information from vision and hearing. If you're hearing everything mm -hmm. and you're seeing everything, what do you do? And your brain's trying to process what the body just doesn't process it at all. So you, they're just, the reason they love water so much is because they can actually feel their whole body at once and it gives them some sense of where they are and it's very peaceful and that's right. why they love water so much. Right. Yeah. Because I've asked some autistic kids and they couldn't really explain it, but I think I, one of them did say something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what it is. And, um, there was also a study that was, um, out in October of 2020. So this was just released. And this was with people with mild autism and they found that their nerve fiber density was 50% less than a neurotypical. What does that mean? Okay. So, so what that means, if your nerve fiber density is lower, that means you're not receiving as much sensory input 
through your nerve fibers. So if you're not receiving as, so let's say you're taking in too much eye, too much ear, too much smell, but then not enough touch. So again, it creates an imbalance in being able to process everything. Where you are in space is critical to everything. And it's also critical to what we call behavior. Remember when I said how they're, they're taking in everything? Well, they're also feeling, and of course, the more severe their autism is in what we call severe severity, I'm just using that not because I like those terms at all, they're mm -hmm. horrible, but just so people understand what I'm talking about, I'm talking about mm -hmm. what we perceive as non-speaking, unreliably speaking, and inability to control the body, okay? And sometimes it would seem like they're unresponsive to direction. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. With those individuals, um, what, he, what Houston and others have explained is they are telling their body to do it, but their body's not doing it. Oh, so okay. So that. It's not that the brain doesn't understand what I said. It's the body doesn't understand. Right. What I said. That's the end. It, like it won't process the motor. Got it. And then also if they can't feel where they are in space, they don't have a sense of what's behind me. Like hmm. where, where's behind if I don't know where I'm at. And and then people think, oh, they don't understand when it's like, I just don't know where I'm at. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it'd be like us in a blind room and somebody telling us to put something in a drawer. And you're like, wait, where, what drawer, what, you know, and then having your hands tied and you're like telling your hands to do it. The way I, the way I explain it to people is, okay, Cindy, would you raise my arm? Would you raise my arm? And you can't, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not connected to it. They're not connected to theirs either. And that's where the, we think they are, but they're not. And that's the motor processing and it, the coordinating all the actual motor. Um, speaking back to apraxia, whenever they get anxious, which like any of us, they all do, we all get anxious, they have even less control. My son was talking to this girl that he adores and he's spelling out everything he wants to say. And he's been so excited because he just adores this girl. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, his mouth starts going QT, 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 which is, you know, quick trip. And he looks at me with like an absolute look of panic. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you, you just tell her. And he, so he spells out, please do not listen to what comes out of my mouth. I can't help it. And their bodies just betray them. Sometimes, again, back to the motor processing, the reason they can't do a motor is because that another motor has taken over like the sensory seeking motor or the myelinated neural pathway motor. One of those has taken over and they just can't execute the motor. See, my son was self injurious and he would literally attack himself. And I mean, you should see his hands. They're horrific looking. And he, at times he would literally like rip skin off yeah, of his I'd hand. like to know about that too. What is that all about? It is, it's essentially, it's, well, it's two things. One is whenever that amygdala gets triggered, that's the fight or flight. And so they are fight or flighting. Okay. They are doing one or the other. Okay. Um, Why do they hurt and, themselves? Yeah, but that's that's still fighting. Mm -hmm. Now, the other part, and it's totally up to you if you want to include this or not, but they see, especially these severe cases. Actually, I hate that word. Especially these you, what the significantly challenged. Okay. That, that's a better way to say it. Mm -hmm. Significantly challenged with body control. Many of them experience both the physical and the metaphysical world. So they're seeing things that the rest of us aren't experiencing. And that can be very upsetting. It can be wonderful and upsetting. Okay, so this is this is the main reason why I brought you on. Now mm -hmm. we're hitting the subject that I really wanted to okay. talk about, okay? Yeah. So on Facebook autism pages, I've seen moms ask this question a couple of times, okay? Mm -hmm. And they said, my child wakes up at four o'clock in the morning and they're laughing hysterically at something. What are they laughing at? And my response was, oh, well, my, and my husband would do this when Robbie would laugh. It was almost like he saw an invisible person in his room that was playing with him and he was cracking up laughing. And we were like, what the heck is he laughing at? And my husband would say, oh, he's playing with his angels today. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I replied to this woman. I said, well, we just say he's playing with his angels. And another person said the same thing. I had an, I had a different woman that said that their son is terrified and said, he sees a man. 
he sees an evil man in his room. And she, and so, of course, you have your two schools that someone's like, well, take him to a psychiatrist. He's, you know, uh, hallucinating, whatever. And then you have all the spiritual people are like, well, maybe he is seeing angels or demons, you know, whatever. So for me, I, as a Christian, I absolutely believe in angels. I believe in demons. I believe in deliverance. I believe in, in heaven and hell. Um, I believe in all this stuff. So I'm very open to this. And, and I always said, Robbie seemed to have a sixth sense that he picked up on people and he could tell if somebody was in uh, my description would be like that is an evil woman and Robbie really doesn't like him and like that person and I know he's picking up on something with her so that's that's where I'm coming from I know you have experience with this yes. and you even wrote a book about this right I did. so yeah. Uh, and we'll 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 give you a plug Talk about that later. Yeah. We'll give you a plug about that at the end. But that's why this is this is the the, the meat of what I really want to do. Okay, so we got to this is how your son is communicating through the mm -hmm. RPM, right? Yes. And so that now he's communicating things to you that he sees and knows and experiences. Yes. So go. Thank you for joining us for part one of today's episode. Be sure to join us again next time to hear the second half of the interview on Spectrum Perspectives. That's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed listening and it helped you gain a new perspective. To see the video version of the show, go to our YouTube channel, Robbie and Me Autism Reality. If you're interested in buying our book series, Robbie's World and his Spectrum of Adventures, the link will be in our episode description as well as my Instagram and Facebook pages. If you enjoyed the show and you'd like more content, please be sure to hit that like button, follow us, and don't forget to leave us a great review. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to join us again on our next episode of Spectrum Perspectives.